All right, well, welcome everybody. And thanks for being back to our class on uh, living faithfully in turbulent times. And as you can see, our, our specific topic for today is how do we live as Christ's ambassadors? And let me just flip to the next picture. Um, in my job, I end up doing a lot of references for students or letters of recommendation for students. And sometimes I'm just writing a letter for them. Uh, sometimes I'm having to answer specific questions that are asked by, um, by the employer that I'm writing to. And so most of the time, my letters and the questions that I get asked for sort of generic jobs have to do with, well, what are the person's skills like? What's their personality like? But some of my students want to go into government service. And so if they're applying to the FBI, for instance, or they're applying to the State Department to work there, there are some very specific questions that go beyond just, oh, how did they, how did they do in school? What kind of their, per, what is their personality? So I get questions like, to your knowledge, does this person ever use drugs? Uh, do they have a high amount of debt? What are the kinds of people they associate with? Have you noticed any unusual behavior? Or have you seen them spending a lot of time with representatives of foreign governments? Interesting questions. And you think, well, why? What do they want to know that for? And I think it's this. For people who are going to be in roles where they're representing the United States, um, their lives matter. Their actions matter. What they do, how they live their lives. They're worried about people who are going to be compromised who might be uh, turned by a foreign government, somebody who represents the United States, their lives matter. And it turns out that that's the case for ambassadors of the kingdom of God too. And so where are we in the, in the class right now? Back to, you know, this, I'm gonna move this to the other side. It's always, this is sort of in the way, no matter where I put it, but um, so, so who are we? What have we learned so far? What we've learned is for most of us, we're Americans, we're citizens of the United States, but that's not our ultimate citizenship. Our ultimate citizenship is that we are members of the kingdom of God. And so this picture that I showed in a previous episode, you know, when we come, this is sort of the, the line at, the, at immigration, when you come in from outside the United States, for most of us, because we're US citizens, we hang a left at this sign. But if we're thinking of our ultimate destiny, our ultimate identity, we really go right here. Our real identity, our real citizenship, our, the one that should drive us is that we're citizens of God's kingdom. We're visitors here. And so what we've seen is that we're, while we're citizens of God's kingdom, we're, we're aliens and strangers here. Now, it's not just that we're here to be tourists and just to you know, hang out, have fun while we're here. No, our role is like Adlai Stevenson on the bottom left where our ultimate citizenship is elsewhere. And we've been given a job here. We're ambassadors. Uh, we're ambassadors for the kingdom of God. And so in our lives, in our words, what we do, we represent his kingdom, not our own. Uh, the confession this morning, the, the group confession of sin this morning had some interesting lines about, you know, Lord, help us to, or we were confessing that often we desire to build our own little kingdoms as opposed to the kingdom of God. And I think this goes to this point. We're really ambassadors of a different kingdom. We're not there to build our own. And it's a full-time commitment. And, and we learned last week that what's, what's the message that we're sending if, if we're there to represent our king and his message, it's that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. We are, our message is be reconciled to God. Sure. And, yes, go ahead, Bob. <clears throat> I think one of the problems is, uh, in the beginning, you said you got, uh, had to write references to the FBI and, and state and so forth. And the FBI, and the state and people you are writing to have a concept of the people they want to join their organization. Uh, they have certain standards, mm -hmm. uh, which is okay. And being an ambassador for Christ, uh, 
the people we are in ambassadors to, which is this world, they also have a concept. And, but their concept of being a uh, ambassador for Christ is completely, or can be very difficult. You, you've heard the, you know, uh, uh, somebody say, well, you know, he's a Christian, but he's a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're based in their concept of a uh, Christian ambassadors on what you uh, act like, which uh, is not necessarily what an ambassador for Christ is. I mean, it, it plays into it. The whole book of James talks about, but it's it's the heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, yeah, no, it's an it's an excellent point. And, you know, when it comes to gaining our role as an ambassador, unlike the letters of recommendation where you're applying and showing your skills level and, and showing that you deserve the job as an ambassador, we get the job because Christ shows us grace and mercy. Um, and, and you're right that ultimately our, our, our identity doesn't rise and fall by our actions. But what we're going to look at today is it turns out that you know, the world may have ideas of what ambassadors for Christ are or should be, but so does Christ. And that the way we live and the way we, the way we use words, for instance, do matter. And so that's going to be largely our, uh, our discussion today. The scripture, it turns out, says some things about what does Christ want to see from his ambassadors in this world? Now, we're not going to ful fulfill this perfectly. We will be hypocrites to some extent because we will sin but nonetheless, we want to see what it is Christ wants from his ambassadors and how we live. Uh, we ended last week here, 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 9. We were contrasting how Jonah was an ambassador and how Paul was an ambassador. And, and Jonah really didn't love the people he was going to. Paul showed love by not seeking personal glory. He was seeking the kings. He was gentle, like a nursing mother, he said. He shared his whole life. He was willing to sacrifice himself for the people he was going to. And so we started talking about what, what, are, what are we supposed to look like? How are we supposed to live? That's where we're headed today. So let me pray for us. Then I'll tell you how we're gonna go about the discussion. So Father, we are thankful that you have made us your ambassadors. You've called us to do it. Even though Lord, as, as Bob was suggesting, we don't deserve that job. And we're not going to fulfill it perfectly. Uh, we are not going to live lives of perfection. But we, but we want as much as possible to imitate your son, to walk like him, to speak as he did. Uh, and so I pray that you'd help us as we look at some of these passages, that you'd help us to know what it is that you desire, what your perfect standard is for your ambassadors. And then, Lord, help us as we talk about how do we live that out and help us to do it. And so we just invite your spirit to lead us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's my plan. Uh, I want to, the beginning is going to be a bit of me lecturing a bit. I'm going to just take us through four passages, draw out some principles that seem to me are pretty consistently stated through the New Testament about how ambassadors are to live. But then I'm going to save time for us to talk about, okay, great, nice words from 2000 years ago, but how do we live those out? How do we fulfill that today in a world that has some unique challenges that maybe Paul wasn't facing or Peter wasn't facing? And so that's kind of how we're going to go. So four passages. I want to start with this one. This is 1 Peter 2, 11 to 12. I put these two verses on the screen. For those of you who've been part of the class for the last few weeks, you'll know this was one of our foundational passages. This is the passage that in the verses before this say that we're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, where we're, we're described as people of God. But then these verses tell us how we're supposed to live in that role. It says, beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage against wage war against your soul. 
keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. And so, you know, in some ways it tells us who we are. We're sojourners, we're strangers here, but it doesn't just tell us that. It tells us how we're supposed to live as aliens and strangers and ambassadors. And it turns out that our lives matter. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers and Paul or Peter expects that they will, they'll see your good deeds and glorify God. And so that even if people want to reject us, want to reject our message, that's their desire, our lives should glorify God in a way that our lives testify to him, testify to his word. Um, if unbelievers are kind of expecting to reject us, expecting to reject our savior, we don't want to give them grounds based on how we live. And it sort of goes back to the point that Bob was making. When we do live in a, word, in a way that's contradictory to what our savior did and said, or maybe our, is contradictory to the way we talk in our own words, it's pretty devastating. Uh, it's this hypocrisy point. Remember about 15 years ago, in this congressional district, there was a congressman who had staked out his kind of his thing, his reputation, his platform was based on being a pro-family man. And so he was very strong on family issues. He strongly opposed same-sex marriage. He took a strong stand against uh, gays in the military. And then it was found that he was soliciting men for sex and that he engaged in homosexual behavior himself. And it was a devastating thing to him, to his family, completely undercut the message that he and the platform that he stood for. And it's not just a political right thing. I think we saw during the Me Too movement, uh, trying to raise awareness of sexual harassment issues. Some of the people who were most vocal on the issue of sexual harassment turned out to have been engaging in sexual harassment and some were forced out of the out of Congress or the Senate for that reason. Careers were destroyed, but the stakes are way higher from eternity when church leaders, pastors live in a way that are inconsistent with messages. And, and perhaps you've, you've seen, we've seen it in this area where somebody turns out to be living a life completely inconsistent with the message that they're preaching from the pulpit. And it's not just devastating to them and their career. It doesn't just harm their church as it always does, but it causes people to fall away. Uh, people sometimes who've really been a part of that church find themselves saying, look, I, I trusted this person. I don't know if I can trust people in the church anymore. We want to live lives, I think this passage says, that leads people to God, doesn't cause them to stumble and lead them away. So one principle, I think, for ambassadors here, how are ambassadors supposed to live? Sojourners, aliens, representatives of the kingdom, our lives, and we won't do this perfectly, but as much as possible, our lives should be consistent with our message. Let's go next to 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23. Paul says this, and I know this violates all rules of PowerPoint. There are a lot of words here, but I wanted you to be able to see the passage. It says, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win some of them, I win more of them. To the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings." And so what, what was Paul talking about? What's he doing here? I mean, though he talks about how in many ways the, the Jewish law is not binding on Christians today <clears throat> in order to not stumble uh, his Jewish brothers, there were times he followed some of the precepts of the Jewish law so that he didn't turn them away. To those who were Gentiles, he didn't try to make them follow principles of the law. He opposed Peter when Peter did that because he didn't want to stumble them. 
interesting phrasing here, to the weak I became weak. I think it's talking about Christians who maybe for conscience sake, they have a weak conscience on things that are disputable matters. And what I think Paul did there was he said, look, if, if there's something that is going to stumble another, I'm just not going to do it to avoid causing them to perhaps do it against their conscience in his day, meat sacrifice to idols, perhaps in our day, use of alcohol, if use of alcohol is going to stumble another, not using it. Um, and so Paul was finding, trying to find ways to connect with those he was ministering to. He was an ambassador to others. He wanted to make his message most attractive to make sure that his life wasn't causing a reaction against what he was saying. He was trying to be as, to make the, the connection for Christ as well as he could. And it reminds me of, of other ambassadors who have been successful. You know, John Adams, and I, I told you about John Adams and, and Ben Franklin in France during the Revolutionary War and their efforts to get the French to engage on the side of the Americans, to fund the American cause. And Adams was often frustrated with Franklin because he thought Franklin was too much of a party boy. And par you know, Franklin was just going to parties, doing the social things. But I think as people look back, as historians look on that period, both of their jobs were really important, including Franklin's desire to make the American cause attractive to the French to make a personal connection with them, to invest his life with them. It mattered. I think the early church uh, was this way. How did the early church grow so much? Historians will say one of the biggest ways was that they actually cared for, loved the poor. They started hospitals. They started showing the love of Christ and connecting with people. So it wasn't just saying words, but their lives were consistent with the message that they were sharing of, of the love of Christ, of the grace of Christ. I, I've shared with some of you, I'm working on a project right now with the American Bar uh, to, for our, the law school, getting ready for an American Bar Association accreditation visit. And it's always a challenge because you've got these people coming in, most from a pretty secular background, taking a look at a Christian law school. And one of the things we've seen God do over the years is have them build a personal connection with us. We try to show them that we, we don't wear horns, for instance, here. We, uh, we're normal people. We can uh, be kind and engage with them on a personal level, care about their families in a way that makes the message of, in this case, the law school, but our, especially the Christian message of the law school palatable. All right, let's look at two other passages and then we're gonna turn this over to some discussion. Um, as part of our lives, how we live with people, how we talk to them and how we talk about them matters. And so I'm gonna go next to 2 Timothy 2, 22 to 26. And Paul is, is writing this letter to Timothy, who is an ambassador. He is preaching the gospel. He's, he's ministering, trying to, to share the ministry of reconciliation, bringing people to Christ. Here's some interesting things that he tell, tells him. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So verse 22 starts with action. Your life is supposed to reflect certain things. Flee these things. Do these things. And he says, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. He knows that, that Timothy is going to face people who reject him and his message. And he says, correcting his opponents with gentleness. Always reminds me of, of Paul's words, speak the truth in love. Um, correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. And so notice at the end, what's the goal? It's, it's this ministry of reconciliation. He wants to see reconciliation, repentance, so that they come to Christ. But how do that? He tells Timothy, look, avoid controversies. Don't be quarrelsome. Now, he's not saying that 
Uh, you don't take a stand. He's not saying that we don't have to be bold sometimes. I mean, we saw last week that sometimes we are to be bold in our statements as ambassadors. Paul specifically asked that he would, uh, that, that, we, that his followers would pray for him so that he would speak the gospel boldly. But in his bold stand for the gospel, he wanted to proclaim it with, with gentleness, not engaging in controversy, um, to, to, to be bold, but to draw his enemies toward him, that they may be drawn toward repentance, remembering the goal all the, way, all the time. And let's read one more passage. And this is from James, a pretty familiar passage probably, but especially dealing with how we talk with one another. How do we use words in the role of an ambassador? ambassador? And so this is James 3, starting in verse 1. And it says, Not many of you should be teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. Again, reflecting the notion, we're not going to do all these things perfectly. We are going to stumble. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, straining, uh, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. And goes on a little bit more there. And so what do we learn from this? Um, I I love the imagery. I mean, it's it's sort of scary imagery in this passage of, of what James says about the damage words can do. And you know, we've all watched um, footage from the forest fires on the Western, in the Western part of the United States this year and over the past few years. And so the, the, the image of, a, of a, our words, the tongue, being able to set a fire, uh, set, set uh, a forest of fire is a poignant image. I mean, we know how out of control it can be, how destructive it can be. James uses these other words. They are, a, a, um, actually, I think he says a world of unrighteousness. So that's a typo. Our words can be a restless evil, a deadly poison. We've got to be so careful with words because of the damage they can do. And then going back to our ambassador status, words also undermine the message. If we are here to share the gospel, to proclaim reconciliation, to be ministers of reconciliation, then our words better be consistent with that. And and James here writes, you know, our words undermine everything we stand for. We bless God with our words, and yet then we curse people who are made in his image. So we're cursing image bearers, even as we're proclaiming that we we, um, bless God. He says, how can it be that we use the same mouth to both bless and curse? So all, I think, principles, none that we will follow perfectly, but these are the things that God wants us to do, some of the things that God wants us to do in our lives as ambassadors. So I'm going to stop this now and sort of put us all back on the screen. And and my question to you is, what are some implications of this for how we live today in our day? Most of these words were written nearly 2,000 years ago. What do they mean for us in our role as ambassadors in the world that we live in? But yeah, um, Bob, go ahead. Well, I think we, 
our words get in our in our way because we try to defend ourselves. Okay. And um, for example, this last election, uh, as a good Christian, I voted, and I voted for the man I think should be president. Uh, but I got to remember that God's in control. And if he doesn't put the man in that I want, you know, that's his prerogative. Uh, and, but you can get nasty by quarreling with people who do not agree with you mm -hmm. in, in your voting. But I think if you keep the idea that God's in control, he'll put in who he wants. And uh, hopefully it'll be the one I want, but not necessarily. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Bob. And, and remembering the sovereignty of God at all points. I mean, sometimes we, we think, oh, my goodness, I'm an ambassador here. I got to make this happen. Or, you know, our job is to make sure that this certain thing occurs. We have to remember God is the ultimate sovereign and how we, and our, and our words and actions ought to reflect that. Good. I think I saw another hand, Rich, perhaps, and then Peter. Okay, uh, Peter. On that same topic, you know, sometimes you read on social media about um, alleged election fraud and all this, and you know people have their documentation. And so in one article I recently said, the catchphrase is release the Kraken, Kraken, which is from a movie I've never seen, but it's basically, we want political justice, we want honesty and all this. So that's what it means. So I typed in release the Kraken and then I respond, responded to my own comment. I said, on second thought, Lord release the Holy Spirit on our country <laughs> and we might you know, repent from our sins and have revival. So that may sort of be a transition that we're talking about. Yeah, yeah excellent point. thoughts about implications of this or, or challenges of doing this in our time. Yeah, Jeff, I think that sometimes we have a tendency to not give people who disagree with us the same benefit of the doubt that we give ourselves um, and that we give people who, who agree with us. Um, I mean, I think there's a certain attitude that we have towards people that we have to really be careful of. I, I kind of think in, in a way that was what Paul was saying when he says, I'm all things to all people. He, he tried to understand where people were coming from and he tried to adjust himself and his message so that he was, I don't want to use the word acceptable, but he was, he, he could approach them with empathy in a way that allowed him to, to present the gospel and the, and the message he was trying to present to them in a way that they could understand and in a way that, that resonated with them. Um, I, I know personally, I have, this, I have this tendency that if, if someone disagrees with me, then I immediately have this gut instinct that tells me they must be evil in some way. And, you know, and I think that's what we have to be careful of. I think that's an excellent point, Rich. And it's, we know this is happening throughout our culture, but it's, I don't think we can just say, can you believe the world? I mean, the world's sort of getting into these armed camps and, and they view their, their op opponents as evil. I think we see us doing this within the church. Let me give you a, st a statistic that talks about the, um, this phenomenon that Rich is mentioning. This was a study done in 2019 uh, by a couple of professors. One was uh, University of Maryland, one at LSU, and they were studying Americans and how they engaged in politics. And, and their study found that 40% of Americans view members of the other party as downright evil. One in five, so 20% of Republicans and, and Democrats agree with the statement that their political adversaries, adversaries quote, lack the traits to be considered fully human. What's well, scary to me when I hear that, and it's, it's sort of looking at those who disagree, as, exactly as Rich said, 
they're not just people who disagree with me that I wanna to try to win to my side by the way I live, by my words spoken in gentleness, perhaps boldly, but spoken in gentleness. Um, they're just evil. And I think it's not that hard to turn from that to Jonah. They don't deserve to the gospel. They're not people who are gonna to come to Christ. I'm not gonna waste my time with them. God, I can't even believe that you are saving those people who put those things on the walls of the palace at Nineveh of chopping heads off their enemies. They don't deserve the, the gospel. And I think it's very possible that we as Christians can do the same thing. Any other thoughts about this or other, other points? Let me show you, I've got a couple other slides that maybe will pr provoke um, further discussion. You know, we, we do live in this time of uh, just great, um, great division, animosity, where we do tend to view people on the other side as enemies. And, you know, the, the, the point about unleashing the Kraken and who should unleash the Kraken or Bob's point about <clears throat> trusting God's sovereignty, how we engage in culture wars are, I think is very interesting. You know, the, there's another study, this is done by the Barna organization. <clears throat> and Barna is a Christian and, and often surveys Christians about what they think, but also the world, what they think about Christians. And so Barna surveyed Americans about how they view the term evangelical or people who are evangelicals. And I pretty much quit using the term evangelical because of the phenomenon that's occurring with this. Uh, but they say, what do people think evangelicals are? Barna says, U.S. adults mostly see evangelicals through a political lens. They say the most common term that people use to describe uh, Ameri American evangelicals is religiously conservative. But their next trait that they associate most with Christian, uh, with most with evangelicals is that they are politically conservative. Um, and so what they see are things like, oops, hang on. This, engage in the culture war. Uh, some of you may know that there's a, there's a church in the United States called Westboro Baptist Church. And they believe they are ambassadors to this world. And what they decided to do was there's a culture war going on we need to take a stand against homosexuality. And so they decided to go to the funerals of soldiers who died in Iraq or Afghanistan who were gay and to protest outside their funerals to get attention for the message that you see all over this slide. Um, and so that's their attempt to be ambassadors for Christ. We talked a little bit about social media and we may want to talk about how we should or should not engage in social media and to sort of avoid showing you examples of social media that have been flying around in America. I want to show you some social media posts from Israel. These are from 2017, but there's a left right division going on in Israel right now. And so I want to show you just some posts that I think capture what Rich was talking about. So these are some posts from some on the right in Israel. The left is full with conspiracies to turn the state into a Palestinian state. Their punishment will, will be worse than the punishment given to terrorists. This is the true face of the leftists. The hatred eats them. They love the Arabs. They hate the right wing. Um, in the elections for the Knesset, we will not forget. We will not forgive. Um, the last one, anti-Semites from the left wing do not need proof of anything. They're just waiting for the destruction of the state of Israel. In other words, they're, and the people on the other side, they're evil. They're absolutely evil. And then look what some of the posts are like. These filthy dogs get a lot of money. They're talking about those on the political left in their country. The, those filthy dogs get a lot of money from hostile elements. Bunch of dogs are all the leftists. All the leftists are traitors. Look at the next one. The country needs urgently pest control against the leftist cockroaches, microbes, vermin, left-wing viruses. They're like a terminal, the Palestinians are like a terminal cancer. 
these are not Christians posting this, but as you were on Facebook or Twitter during this time, do you see posts like this going on in our country? Lots of them. <laughs> yeah, and one example, you know, I'm more in the content rather than the name calling, but I put a post out there, you know, and someone commented back from the other side and they made a, a good point. And so I replied, touche. And they sort of diffused it and they put a smiley face response. And good. You know, made a good point, I made a good point and we sort of left it at that. Yeah, I think that's really important, Peter, and, and a good example of how we ought to engage. But I don't think we do always. I, I was Last night, you may know, there was a, an important decision came down in an election lawsuit in Pennsylvania. And so I was on Twitter a little bit, just seeing what people were saying about it. And there was some blasting from both sides. But there was one person in particular who I know is a Christian, who sometimes in her tweets post scripture passages, who testifies to Christ. She was angry with somebody who had posted something about the decision last night. And rather than do what Peter did, or say something to try to diffuse the situation, uh, and, or even answer on the merits, she simply made a reference to the size of uh, the male parts of the other person. And it was just, oh, don't do that. You're representing Christ, you know, in the rest of your tweets, you're doing this. And so it was just a reminder to me of how dangerous in our day, you know, I'm not saying get off Twitter or Facebook or other social media forums, but we gotta be pretty careful. Uh, the, the words that James spoke about the fire that can be unleashed by words can, can really be done with words that we post. And sometimes it's easier to say words like that when we're not face to face with people. Somehow there's a little less, it's a little less personal when we just write words and then hit the word, hit the button send so I think one lesson of this is, is as ambassadors, we got to be super careful there. Yeah, I think there's there's a point when you're talking about social media, even email. Um, I, I think a question you should probably ask yourself is, would I say the same words that I'm writing here face to face with that person? Yeah, that's an excellent point, Rich. Let me ask one more question. So we live in this age. We've talked a little bit about just some personal cautions, maybe some personal tips like diffusing, uh, pausing before ever hitting send and wondering, would I say this face to face? Or sometimes I ask myself, how would I feel if this thing showed up in, uh, in a lawsuit someday? Would I, or, or were printed in a newspaper? Would I want to read this about myself? Um, but how do we as a church engage with our culture around us or our neighbors around us in a time when we know divisions are deep and anger is high? What are ways that we can engage to be faithful ambassadors? We can have an eye out for opportunities we can have an eye out for opportunities to promote God's character and his ways in our casual conversations with people or our media posts. Um, Cause there are a lot of misconceptions about God out there. Yeah. And there are also aching hearts that are just looking for a reason to hope <laughs> and a comment here and a comment there can increase their positive concept of God and it might get them thinking about God more in their spare moments. It's a great point, Marie. And you know, the idea that maybe this is a most important time for us to be engaged as ambassadors with positive messages about hope and where hope can ultimately be found, whether we do that on online or you know, in person in our in our personal relationships. Excellent. Yeah, I'll just add I have a Bible app on my phone, which is you know, the Bible and so forth, and it's got a verse of the day. And so I will go and whatever the verse is, you can pick a picture to go with it, essentially. 
yeah. you can share it. So you share it to Twitter, share it to Parler, wherever you want to share it. Uh huh. Good. Any other thoughts? Show you one last slide. Most of my slides have been kind of negative today. Um, but I think as I was thinking about our church and perhaps things where um, you know we've tried or where we where things that we've done our best in reaching our neighborhood, I think back to on the right the EFL program as a way of reaching beyond our normal um, circles. We've had a chance to you know reach people most of whom I don't think are Christians. Some have been Christians, but we've also been able to have conversations where people are going through things in their lives. People have struggled with certain things. People have had questions and we've had the chance to hopefully show the love of Christ, but also speak words on behalf of Christ. Uh, I think back over the years of our, on the left side of the screen, just outreaches to the neighborhood where in a time when life is hard and people are, are challenged and life is kind of ugly, helping in with a simple task like raking their leaves or doing trunk or treat at the church. I think are ways that we can, we have tried as a church to both show the character of Christ, but also um, speak words, hopefully that might come out of that. And, and I think as a church, it's been hard during this time to do as much as perhaps we've normally been doing. We don't, you know, thankfully preschool's going again, EFL's not, but I think we have to really think, how can we in a time of COVID do this? We've got maybe a minute or minute or so left. Any other thoughts about how we can or should engage with words and actions? Kara. Yeah, I, I've been thinking about how we know that the things that come out of our mouth come from what's inside our hearts. And um, when we breathe in God's word, um, who God is, what he's done for us, how he responds, you know, through his, through scripture, um, through meditation, through, you know, community with other people, that is how we breathe out the, the right words um, when we don't feel like it um, or, even when we see the pain and grief and hurt of others around us, um, it shouldn't come from, you know, our own thoughts, um, our own feelings. Um, those thoughts and feelings that, that where that comes from is the source has to be God's word. Excellent. Yeah. I think it's a great way to sort of tie things up. Um, yeah, these words better come from Christ because we know our natural tendencies. I mean, how often have you been really frustrated by something that you've seen? And it might be the political world. It might be something going on with COVID. It might be something in a personal relationship that you look and say, I can't believe they just did that or said that. And your natural instinct is to lash back. But we need to be engaged in Christ's word, to be, be in his word, to be praying so that it, the Holy Spirit is the one who's going to control our response and have the attitude, as I think I just saw in the chat from the Alexander family, to be servants, to, to be servants of Christ, servants of others. Um, let me just close our time in prayer because we need the Holy Spirit to help us with this. This is hard, and especially in a climate like ours today. Father, thank you for this time. And Lord, we thank you that we can be in your presence, in your word. We're not just sort of left, uh, probably like uh, Adams and, and Franklin were for months without any instructions from home and they had to sort of act on their own. We can be in your word daily. We've got your Holy Spirit living within us to guide how we are to be your ambassador, the things we're supposed to say as your ambassador. Please help us to do that, to follow you Hold us back at the moment we were about to hit send, Father, and we ought not to. Give us the love of Paul and not the hatred of Jonah for the people around us. Help us not to see our opponents as, as enemies, but as image bearers of yours, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jeff. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Good discussion. Next, sure. week we're going to take a look at uh, somebody who actually tried to live this out. We're going to take a look, at, look at the life of Daniel as an ambassador. Hey, Jeff. Yes. Uh, this has nothing to do with the subject, but uh, J.C. Ryle stated that Samson did one great thing for the Lord despite his life. He died bringing down the temple of David. I, I, I like just that. remember it when I heard Jeff this morning. Yeah. No, it's a really good point that uh, in the end he does die and God brings great good from his death in yeah. protecting his people. Yeah. Great anyway, point. thank you. Yep. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.